Hello, Dr. Smith, and welcome to Computer Science Chats. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me, Victor. Uh, thank you for being on the program. So I've prepared several questions to ask you. Uh, first, could you please introduce yourself and your educational background? Sure. So my name is Mike Smith. I'm the John H. Finley Jr. Professor of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. Uh, and I have had many years of schooling that I'm happy to talk about if you're interested. I was formally trained as an electrical engineer and a computer scientist. Thank you very much. So what is it that inspired you to pursue computing as a career? Sure. So I started uh, interest. I start with my interests in computing, which really started in my high school years. Um, we are we had a uh, what was called a teletype installed in my high school back in the mid to late 70s and 1970s. And it was connected to the David Sarnoff uh, Research Center at RCA Labs, which I don't know how many of your listeners will even know and be familiar with the company of RCA. But at the time, it was a big company, both into the components and the computing devices. It was a brand new thing to all of us at the school. Uh, for me, it was an opportunity to explore this uh, you know, emerging space. Uh, try new things, just try to get the machine to do anything useful was really kind of what we did with our time there. Uh, and that grew over time. I really didn't think of it as a career, probably until soon into my college years when I discovered that I was actually enjoying my time in my engineering and computer science classes a lot more than I was enjoying my time when I thought I was going to be a physicist is what I went to college thinking I was going to be. So that's when I really switched over and, and started taking more courses in that space, mostly from the interest of what can I do with this kind of technology? I'm really an engineer at heart. What, what can we do to make things that will help people in society? That's very interesting. Uh, could you describe some of the activities that you do through your work? Uh, what do you find like most and what do you find most challenging about them? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think of it in phases, right? I've been in, my career has been long enough that I've really done many different things at many different times. So when I first got out of college, I was working for Honeywell Information Systems, uh, a manufacturer of computers at the time. The computers at the time are not the kinds of things that we see today. It was mostly around mainframes and mini computers. Um, they also did build uh, dumb terminals to connect to these mainframes and so forth. So I spent my time there really focused on how do we build the hardware, right? And at the time we were using simple integrated chips, NAND gates, registers, multiplexers, simple things like that and figuring out how to wire them together to build these more complex machines. The challenge at the time um, was as microprocessors were just starting to become popular um, and how to convince the leaders of the company at the time that we really should be in this space. We should be thinking about building, not just with these simple integrated chips, but with these more sophisticated microprocessors. That led me to the next phase of my life when I was in graduate school and in my early years at Harvard, looking at microprocessor design, what was the next kind of innovations that we wanted to do in that space? It was quite exciting at the time. Parallelism was really starting to take off. Do we want to pull multiple processors together to have them doing coarse grain parallelism. I got more interested in the kinds of fine grain parallelism. How do we change the actual architectures of these microprocessors to do it? And it was a real challenge to get people to think about that. Um, to next stage in my life, it was, all right, we've been doing all these things to help out with performance and what we want to do with the actual hardware itself. What else can we do with these kinds of techniques? That got me into the security space and how do we think about securing the kinds of transactions that we're all doing day in and day out on the internet um, and do it in a way that, that can be resilient to what an adversary might be doing. Um, so all the way through to today, I won't go through all of it, to where I'm really interested today in the intersection between education and technology. So today I'm thinking about both what it takes to educate people 
and think about not just who wants to become a computer scientist, but how do we make computing a competency for, for everyone? Um, to what do we need to do for educational institutions like the one I work at? And how do we change so that their business model includes what we should be doing on the internet and in the digital world and not just in the physical world? Yeah. So I read on your webpage and you just said now, and I know that your work spans uh, a wide range of topics like computer architecture, security, and like computers in society. Can you talk about how researchers identify new directions or new fields to pursue? Yeah, fascinating topic. There's so much that we could talk about in this field. Um, for your listeners, if they're interested, a mentor of mine just recently published a book, Venki Nanaranamurti. Uh, his book's called The Genesis of Techno Science Revolutions. If people are really interested in this topic, I encourage them to pick that book up and, and take a look at it. I'll speak personally how I do it and how I have thought about it in my career. Lots of different ways to do this. I'm not trying to say that this, what I'll say for me, works for me is working for everyone, but um, I like to dabble. I like to dabble in lots of different things. I never find that I'm actually, though I made it sound like I was only working on one thing at a time. That was probably the main thing I was working on, but I would dabble in lots of different things to try and keep my eyes open to other opportunities as they came up. Uh, I like to follow along and understand what kinds of trends are, are taking place in the world and where those trends, what are the implications of those trends. Um, and then you start to think about, well, if this trend is starting to take place, when is the right time for you to actually jump and stop doing what you're currently doing and now move to doing something new? I found it's very helpful to, to do some reading about history. Uh, you know, computing's not been around for all that long, but we do have a history. If I just take us back to the work I was doing with microprocessors and the fine-grained parallelism we were doing there, the actual original work was done in the 1960s, right? So going back and reading what was it they were trying to do then? What was it was keeping them from doing more? What trends have changed today? And how are things with technology and society? What, what do people want to do this? How has that changed? And so those sorts of things all get integrated and that helps me think through, yeah, it looks like this is going to become a hot topic. This is going to be something interesting. Are there questions in there that I care about? And therefore, do I want to go off and jump and get into that space? So I've kind of repeated that over and over in my career, or you can think of me as getting bored easily in a topic and wanting to move on to something else. But that's kind of the, the big, big arc for it. Yeah, I also read in your biography that you started on the computer science path by working in industry. I know you said for Honeywell, and then further yep. pursued your studies with a doctoral degree. Uh, what is it that made you make such a transition and how difficult was it? Yeah, great question. So the the transition itself, I'll tell you why I did it. Um, when I was working at Honeywell, it was kind of one of those points in time where industry was really changing. Right? As I said, when I walked into the company and started working with them, they were building all kinds of different machines, everything from those dumb terminals to the mainframes. By the time three years later, when I ended up leaving, they had either sold off or shut down a lot of their lines because microprocessors and personal computers were really starting to take off. And what businesses were buying were different kinds of computational machines than they were producing at the time. So there was a macro trend, if you will, going on that made it easy for me to think about doing something different. Um, personally, from a perspective, I learned, one of the things I learned about myself was I didn't like working for a really big company being told what to do. I wanted to have more freedom to try and explore things myself. So that encouraged me to go back to grad school, get some more education so that I could pursue more kind of a research career in it. Uh, and then I also found that I enjoyed teaching. So I had done some after hours teaching at the company. And one of the ways to get into more teaching was to go get more schooling. So that was, those were the kind of trends that pushed me in that direction. The hardest challenge in the whole thing, honestly, had to be the fact that I was making, I was in a good job. I was making good money. And then all of a sudden I decided to go back to be a grad school, grad student again, not making any money. All my friends would go out on the weekends and have fun and I was staying home doing problem sets again. So that was that was a little bit of a transition. Thank you. I also noticed that you were one of the co-founders of Liquid Machines, which is a company that builds software to protect intellectual property and sensitive information. 
what was the process of developing such a company? And do you have any advice or suggestions for someone who might want to start their own software development company? Yeah, I think there's, again, a lot of resources out on the net. I won't spend too much time talking about you know, what you should be doing and thinking about when you get started. I'll talk about it more from what I don't think they tell you enough of uh, from that whole perspective. One of the things that I really learned going, first of all, I loved it, right? Starting my own company was a huge amount of work. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount. I learned a tremendous amount that helped me with some of the other things I did later in my career. Um, but you have to realize when you're starting up a, a startup, you have to do everything, right? If there are certain only things that, like I like doing this, I don't like doing that, <laughs> you're probably not wanting to get started with a startup because in the beginning, everybody does everything no matter what you need to do to get started. That's one of the things I hadn't realized when I got started in it. The other thing I think is important is, is being thoughtful about the people you're going to do this work with. You're going to spend a lot of time with them. You need to trust them. You need to get up in the morning and say, this is who I want to go spend the rest of my day with, right? It's those sorts of things. So thinking carefully, what are their motivations for, for going off and doing this work too? Do they align with the motivations that you're trying to do? All those sorts of things. Anything you can figure out about that to begin with, I think will make the process of doing what you're going to end up ever doing more successful. Yeah, I'm also aware of your commitment to looking at the intersectionality of technology and other fields like education. Uh, you were involved in the launching of edX and served in its board. And having taken courses in edX, uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to have access to learning through it. So what was it like being involved in such an impactful project? Yeah, it was fantastic. I loved it all the work that we did it's it's i'm continuing it now with what what are we thinking about as the next phase for something like that um i think this is another place where history helps tremendously um edX, this, you know that kind of work was not this is not the first time we've done that there had been opportunities and ventures in previous years where people and in, in, in academia tried to go off and launch sorts of things like this you know, why did it work this time? I think um, it's a really interesting question to think, why did it take off as well as it did today? In, in contrast to what we were just talking about with the, my software company, where we started that really from the perspective of, we have some technology, we have some ideas that we think the market will be interested in. In this case, when I was involved in the beginnings of edX, it was really from the opposite side. I had lots of faculty coming to me. I understood what students were trying to do and how they were approaching their studies in my class differently than I had done or recent students had done. You could really tell that there was a real demand out there for online resources, resources where you could spend more time with it, back things up, it didn't just have to be a live lecture kind of a thing. Um, I had faculty who wanted to do this work where I think some of the reasons why it didn't work in previous ventures was it was hard to get faculty to understand why this was important. So all of those sorts of things mixed with the kinds of things you've talked to me about made it a wonderful experience for us. It was fantastic to work across universities uh, in this space. Um, and I think, you know, there's lots of challenges that still remain. We still don't understand how best to do this. Um, how do you take most advantage of faculty time in this space to come up with resources that are useful and, and impactful for the students who are taking the work? Um, how do you reach all the audiences that we need to reach out there? I think these are all questions that we still don't have good answers for and we're continuing to look at and understand what can do. Um, and it's, it's, it's helped us out in so many ways, certainly from the perspective of what happened recently with the pandemic and the immediate switch that we all had to make to online learning. Our experiences with edX and the other institutions that were deeply involved in it, I think that certainly helped us to, to do a better job at that transition. So there's an interesting connection all over the place, but I don't think we're far from seeing the end of what needs to be done in that space. Thank you. I also know that you're an advisor to a variety of firms, uh, several of which are involved in venture capital. Uh, what is this experience like and what skills should someone, say a high school student like me viewing this, uh, develop to be prepared for such a future component to their career? Sure. 
so I, yes, I, I do a whole bunch of different advising. I enjoy it tremendously. Why do I like it? It's fun because I really get to see some of the emerging trends like we were talking about before. This is a way for me to see, okay, I've seen this trend. What are people now doing with this as they move out into space? You get to meet some unbelievably interesting people people that are so passionate about what they want to do in that space. Hopefully I can provide a little bit of insight into thinking through what their next steps might be based on my own experience in that space. So it's one of the reasons I enjoy it. For someone like yourself, thinking about how to get into this space eventually, I think there's probably like three things you can do. First of all, stay curious, right? The more curious you are, um, the more opportunities you will have to provide you know, insights into many different kinds of businesses. I think you should also learn, you know, if you're a computer scientist, there's a whole business side to what we do. Learning the business side of it, if you want to get into this space, will be vastly important. There's things that 20 years ago I never understood. Today I understand better because of some of the things that I do. And they really make a difference for what's going to be successful in the market. How do you approach the market? And, and, and so on. And then build your network, right? Everything is an opportunity for you to get to know people. Um, and then you'll never know when you might need to chat with those individuals again. So those three things, stay curious, like bagging it here, stay curious, learn about the business side and build your network will we'll set you up well for that. Yeah. So this is a bit more of a general question, but what advice would you have for high school students who would like to get into computer science, computing in general, or even academia? Yeah, I think the academia one's the easiest answer to give you. It's uh, opportunities to do research, right? That's, that's our bread and butter other than the teaching side of the world, but the things that you could do today are really, what does it mean to say, I want to push the frontier of knowledge? What's involved in that? Um, lots of different ways, lots of different programs out there to get uh, involved in that. I think from the perspective of just getting involved in computing, where I would encourage people to look today is data science, machine learning technologies, they're all taking off. There's so much data out there. It's a real opportunity for you to get involved and do some interesting projects that are not just focused solely on issues of programming or machines or you know how computational algorithms work, but really how can these sorts of technologies have impact in our world today? Uh, I would have your listeners Google tech science, for example, and look at some of the papers that are involved in a website like that, that just show you how you can take a bunch of data that exists out there that has been collected and ask an interesting question and pull some interesting insights out of it. And it's a fantastic way to learn some things about computation, learn some new techniques, but do something that has a bigger purpose. Yeah, thank you so much. And as a final question, where do you think computing or computer science education is going to go in the future? Yeah, great question. So we talked a little bit about where I think um, education is going to go. I think we need to focus not just on, this is one of the things I'm working a lot on right now, not just how do we educate individuals who want to be computer scientists, but how do we make computing uh, general competency for lots of people on the way in the world in the same way that math and writing and literacy is. Um, I think the way computing and computer science are going to change, so much is happening around uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, everything seems to be embedded with that today. But we still don't really have a good idea of where's the balance point, right? What is it that we should be doing with these technologies that we really need to be using these technologies for? When can we use them to better help out individuals, humans that are making decisions in these spaces? And how do we configure it to do that better? And when should we just let the humans continue to make those decisions and not, not bring in some artificial intelligence? I think those are the questions that many people are grappling with today. And in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see some major changes in that space. Thank you very much for meeting with me and for being willing to do this interview. Of course, it was my pleasure. Thank you.